everybody. Welcome to your very first mailbag of the weekend. I'm Perry. This is Dennis. We got a whole bunch of questions to cover today, and they all came from four places. Email, which is mailbag at collider.com. They came from Twitter. They came from Instagram and Facebook. So if you want your question addressed right here on the show, that's where you send it. And as always, a reminder, mailbag isn't just a YouTube video show. We also have a podcast as well. It is under the Movie Talk feed, so check that out. Tell everybody you know about it. Dennis, I feel like you're you're a little light on the desk today. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's unusual I, for I you. wanted to show off my two new Rick and Morty. Uh, they're not pop figures. They're vinyl. Uh, another okay, brand of, okay. of pop or, or Funko. How dare you go away from Funko and get anything yeah. else? And so I, I, I wanted to show off my large-headed Rick and large-headed... There. Hopefully uh, next weekend I'll be able to show off my new It Pop. Yes. Because Dennis has... Uh, he's I'm like an instigator. Me, yeah. I'm an enabler. I'm an enabler. This is part of the reason I have this problem, actually. <laughs> it, it has... It started when I moved here and I saw your collection. Yes. And he... On uh, Instagram, you message me all this stuff yeah. all the time. Yeah. And then I can't help it and I buy more. Yeah. So hopefully Thanks you'll have that on display. <laughs> Next week. Next week. All right. First question today is an Instagram question, and it comes from Jonathan Rios, who writes, what aspect of the filmmaking process do you think is often underappreciated? I'm personally fascinated by film scores and how many scores are still recorded with a live 100-plus piece orchestra. What you got for uh, For me, I think it's definitely editing, and, you know, in, in a subway sound editing as well, because it's it's what they called it, like invisible art. It's mm-hmm. the thing that you're not seeing on screen. You can see everything else on screen, right? You can see the actors, you can see the dialogue, you can see the costumes, production does. You can hear the music, you can hear the dialogue, all, all that stuff. But editing is something where you, usually when it's at its best, you don't even notice it. And there's a lot of things that editors do that help the performances and help a lot of stuff in the movie, but you they don't get the credit for it because you're just, you're watching the final product and and the best ones are they immerse you into the movie so you're not even thinking about it yeah i would go as far to say every position <laughs> on a film that isn't the director or the actors i think is to one degree or yes. another underappreciated but just to throw two out there that i really admire Sound, mm-hmm. um, sound just across the board in post production, but also on set because, you know, having gone to film school, and you know, when you're in film school and you're making a project with your classmates, at one point you're always in some sort of position, like a position you haven't done before. And the position that used to stress me out the most was when I had to run sound on somebody's set because you could easily screw that up. Could mm-hmm. you imagine doing an entire shoot and then realizing the sound isn't great? And it's just, it, it, there's so much detail in there too. Cause you know, I remember just making a movie outside mm-hmm. and every little crackle, they're picking up a car going by, airplanes overhead. It, it seems like a very stressful uh, position to me. The other one I want to point out is, is food, Cra- mm-hmm. crafty and catering because Yeah, you might not see the wonderful craft service table or the lunches on screen, but it really is important to have a healthy, balanced meal Mm -hmm. during a shoot schedule because it really could affect, and you know, I'm not blowing this out of of proportion, Mm -hmm. it could really affect a crew if you're talking about, you know, food that isn't great for you and makes everybody sluggish for half the day. And it just, you know, it it increases, uh, it ups the mood and that increases productivity and probably creativity. So I give a lot of credit out there to people who are running lunches, dinners, crafty, and are actually putting into the equation, you know, how it might affect health and energy level and things like that. And taste too. That's kind of one of the un, kind of unsaid rules about uh, even indie sets is that you have to have good yeah. craft service. You have to have good food so that even if it's a set where people are getting either paid nothing or getting Mm -hmm. paid very little, that they feel good about their meals. I think that was one of the first lessons I ever learned in film school. (laughs) One professor told us, never get pizza for a meal. Yeah, because they're always, you know, that's like the easy thing and everyone gets it. And 
you can't look forward to pizza if it's every single time. One shoot that I was on, I took a risk and I hired a uh, a person to do the meals that was like, I mean, very, very health conscious to the point that we couldn't have milk in the morning because it was taking too long to make the milk because she insisted on peeling almonds and making real almond milk. and. Honestly, so we would peel the almonds and make the milk. And, and as the producer, like, I shouldn't have been doing that. But yeah. I was getting up at like 3, 4 in the morning to peel almonds. And one time <laughs> she made a uh, hot so, chocolate out of the almond milk. And it was incredible. But, oh, my God. It I'll sounds like that. not a good use of the resources no, and no. time and energy. <laughs> the, a lot of the meals were really great. But they took they took a long time to prepare. All right. What's our next question? Our next question comes to us on Facebook, uh, Etienne uh, Bowler of rice, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> Are you asked, sure you just said bowl yeah, of rice? Yeah. Bowl, bowl of rice? I don't know. Would you guys cast, who would you guys cast as the Riddler in the DCEU and you think he should be one of the next big bad guys? Also, what do you think of Andy Serkis if he was cast for the Penguin? So this question obviously stems from the recent rumor we were covering this week on Movie Talk, which was that uh, the Penguin could wind up being mm -hmm. a villain in one of the upcoming DC movies, whether it is Matt Reeves' as The Batman or the Birds of Prey movie. So so when we were talking about that on Movie Talk, one of the points that I brought up, because I think it was a toss question that Ellis had given us, should they go with an iconic villain or someone lesser known? And given what we've seen from that film franchise recently, I do think it's going to up the hype and make some fans more excited if we see an iconic villain. So the idea of the Riddler being mm -hmm. in there does really appeal to me. And I like Jim Carrey's Riddler a little too much. <laughs> I loved that movie growing up. but. The two names that came to mind for that role were, one was Walton Goggins, oh, yeah. mainly because I think he'd be great in that role. I think he's a very talented actor, but I want to see him get a villain role that isn't just a cookie cutter, one note thing that almost has no impact on the plot beyond being a foil to our hero. So I'd like to see him get like a meaty role. Mm -hmm. And then Evan Peters, I think, would be a great Riddler. If you have seen Evan Peters throughout the American Horror Story seasons, mm -hmm. he never stops astounding me. Because, you know, with American Horror Story, I always get a little concerned that it's going to be like too much of a shtick if you have the same exact cast coming back each time and they play, you know, d slightly different characters. And it's kind of just them playing dress up every time. I don't think that's the, been the case with most of the main cast, but Evan Peters in particular has lost himself in every single role I've seen on that show. Yeah, I really like your Walton Goggins pick. I mean, he. the funny thing is, in movies, yeah, he gets cast in kind of more of those one-dimensional, but on TV, he's he plays villain yeah. roles, but they're very deep like justified and and shield and like like he plays characters that have a lot of depth and he's more the villain slash antagonist role and he does it so well so yeah seeing him in that role uh would would be great. What do you think about uh, Andy Serkis's Penguin? I'm open to that. I mean, Andy Serkis is one of those actors who I can confidently say I'd be happy if he was cast in any movie, any mm -hmm. role. I think he is so insanely talented. I came up with a couple other names also because it's a topic of conversation mm -hmm. right now. Some names that I've seen thrown, thrown out around there was, of course, Josh Gad. A lot mm -hmm. of people are talking about Josh Gad right now. Patton Oswalt and uh, Paul Giamatti are two names I've seen circling people's, you know, penguin fan casting lists and I think I would be happy with any of those options but the one that came to my mind was uh, Michael Stuhlbarg from mm -hmm. uh, he was in Call Me By Your Name he was also in um, The Shape of Water and you know even actually thinking about the Riddler because the part I keep going to in Shape of Water and I don't want to spoil that movie but there's there's one part towards the end where he almost gets a little maniacal mm -hmm. and that makes me think a little of the Riddler but with, with him in particular I do think he's someone that could bring a lot to the role the penguin as well yeah i think andy circus would be a good choice especially you know you see him you know he's known as the motion capture performance capture artist but then you see him you know in live action in black panther and he's he's great in that so i think he could fit the role i know that another name that people have been talking about is maybe toby jones as the penguin i'm always uh, fine with that uh, he's a he's a he's a great actor and then for the riddler i had joel edgerton i think Ooh. he's a very versatile actor if you see you know especially something in the what was it, the gift or black yeah. mass he plays characters that are not so great not 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 
not exactly good guys, but he, they have depth to them. So I think he could bring something to uh, the Riddler. I like that. What do you think of the idea of the Riddler or even the Penguin overall? Because we never got your opinion on the Penguin thing. Uh, just being in the movie? Yeah, yeah I think so, as, as long as... It fits, I mean, it's, it really depends on what kind of world Matt Reeves wants to mm -hmm. build and what kind of penguin does he, I mean, because, you know, we had the Danny DeVito one from Batman Returns, but that's, that was kind of more theatrical, over the top, you know He's what I mean? very but, much tied to the Tim Burton style. Yes, exactly. Much like the Joker, Jack Nicholson's Joker was in the first Batman. Mm -hmm. So if Matt Reeves is going for a more real, is he going to go more the Nolan route where it's like a more realistic thing or whatever, then his penguin or his Riddler have to fit into that world. That's what I'm more concerned about. Yeah, I'm dying to know already. Yeah. I'm just dying for some concrete information on the Batman. It's like, we've been waiting. Give us something. Yeah. All right. Next question is an email from Ashley and Ashley writes, what is the most quotable movie from the 20 teens, and what quote from that movie do you and your friends say to each other the most? I graduated college in 2009, and my college friends and I still quote Elf, Mean Girls, and She's the Man to each other. I was wondering what newer movies are that quotable? Yeah. I didn't really think about that, but I tried to look up kind of more recent movies, and she said like the 20 teens, which is fairly, that's a, you're only talking the yeah. last five years, and I couldn't really find too much. I mean, Whiplash, uh, the Not My Tempo, not my tempo uh, Birdman, <laughs> Popularity is the slutty little cousin of Prestige. Yes. Like, uh, there are some movies, but actually, yeah, I, you know, I tend to go towards old, the, the two movies that I, I quote the most, one she, she mentioned was... Mean Girls. And the other one is Rounders. Rounders, like almost anything John Malkovich's character says in that movie is, is, yeah. is quotable. It, well, you know, I, I have the same kind of pool of movies. I'm glad that Ashley brought up She's the Man. There's an <laughs> undervalued comedy. That movie is so funny. But Elf and Mean Girls are definitely in there for me. When I look, you know, way down the line into the future and think about what winds up becoming iconic. I think of, of like a Guardians of the Galaxy. I mm -hmm. mean, really, when you see the form that I Am Groot has, has taken on, mm -hmm. that feels like an obvious one. Bridesmaids is a big one for me. And there's a lot of things in that movie that I like to quote, but I think the one that comes to mind the most is basically anything that happens in that plane sequence. Mm -hmm. Because I love that whole sequence from start to finish. And I'm not just talking about Kristen Wiig's character. Mm -hmm. There's so many little, like, in, like, just genius side conversations happening. But really, anytime I go on a plane and I see, like, those curtains, I want to be like, I'm ready to party. <laughs> or, or, like, every single time I see someone named Steve, I think of Stove. So <laughs> Oh, th there's one of them. What else? Did I oh, so the movie Young Adult with Charlize Theron, the one part that I always bring up is when she's when she's making fun of um, Elizabeth uh, Reeser's character, and she goes, she goes, are you just gonna stand there like like a big lump? And then she says to someone, I love your sweater. So it's like, well, I don't know, just like the lump line makes me laugh. Um, another one is probably what we do in the shadows, just because so so much of what's said in that movie is tied to those performances. Mm -hmm. So you know when you hear a certain intonation on a line and you catch yourself like just using those words and having nothing to do with anything in the movie, but you you catch yourself saying it the same way. Yeah. It's like, this isn't the, the, the 20 teens, but when I think about uh, heavyweights, it's like every single time I'm in a deli and there's deli meat, I have to go oh, like, oh look, a deli meat. Like, why do I do that? It's because it's I have to say it's, it's, it just like and that. And it's ingrained in your head. And then it's, you've heard it probably so many times. It's a problem. What's your favorite Mean Girls line? Oh, there's so many. Uh, what is it? She doesn't even go here. Uh, on Wednesdays, we wear pink. I want my we pink. We should start that uh, yeah. here on Wednesday. Uh, I want my pink shirt back. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that line. Uh, yeah, there's so there's a ton. Let me see here. Oh, I'm not a regular mom. I'm a cool mom. <laughs> Just the way that Amy Poehler delivers that line. Uh, I have I have a problem with that movie quoting it. I'm also big into quoting Billy Madison because I know too many mm. lines from that movie. Uh, though there's the montage about Regina George yeah. where it's uh, one time she punched me in the face. It was <laughs> awesome. Like there's there's so many lines from that movie that are. They're, they're very quotable. That's a good toss question. So whether it's the 20 teens or any movie for that matter, why don't you hit the comment section below and share some of your favorite movie quotes there. I always love hearing what everybody thinks about that. On to the next one. What do we got for number yes. four? Number four, we have 
it from email, Mark writes, Hi, last weekend I rewatched the four Jurassic films for Fallen in preparation, I guess, for Fallen Kingdom next week. Minor compensation for UK having to wait for Ant-Man and the Wasp. For me, The Lost World is an underrated sequel. Which other sequels do you think do not get the credit that they deserve? All right. I obviously can't speak for everybody on The Lost World, but I do think what happens with The Lost World is most people, or again, I hate saying most people, but I think some just think about the end mm -hmm. where you bring the T-Rex to the mainland because admittedly I love that movie from start to finish but admittedly that part has you know a little bit of I mean almost like a goofy quality where they feel like two drastically different movies but so much of it takes place mm -hmm. on the island and it's so good so, some of my favorite visuals I mean I love the stuff with the RV but one of my favorite visuals in all of the Jurassic Park movies is the raptors in the field I love that scene so much so I would include that on my list here. Another one that I've caught myself watching a lot recently is The Addams Family Values. As a kid who, who went to camp, there's something about that movie that always speaks to me. I find it so funny. I love that. I don't think Gremlins 2, the, the, the new batch, gets enough love. And that's another one that I think doesn't get a lot of credit because, you know, I, I think the, the first Gremlins had a campy vibe to it, but Gremlins 2 is like, whoa, crazy comedy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I suspect maybe some out there might look down on it for that reason. And jumping into some other horror ones, Final Destination 2, 3, and 5. I think that that franchise, you know, when you think about uh, early 2000s slasher movies, it's, oh, they're like, they're, they're not as good. Mm -hmm. But I think those three movies in particular really use that concept to great effect. I don't think Scream 4 gets enough love either. Mm -hmm. Scream 4, I, I love the opening sequence, and I really do like some of the things they did in that franchise. But Scream 4 in particular is one of those movies that kind of came and went, and there were a lot of cool ideas there. Yeah, for me, it's two movies that kind of get crapped on for you know, not being as good as their pr predecessors, which is actually true, but I think uh, Kick-Ass 2, I actually enjoyed Kick-Ass 2. It still captures the spirit of the first movie. It's just not as good. I love Jim Carrey's character in there. And then The Bourne Legacy, I know, gets a lot of crap because it doesn't have Matt Damon. It doesn't actually have Jason. Yeah. I think if The Bourne Legacy was called something else and had nothing to do with Bourne, and people would have accepted it a lot better because I think it's a it's a pretty decent action film with Jeremy Renner in there. It's just that once you tie something, and this this applies to you know even something like you know we're talking about like Star Wars yep. now, right? It's it's one of those things where oh because it has that name, it has that franchise attached to it, mm -hmm. the expectations are so much higher, and so when you get something that like for me, right? I didn't love Solo. I liked it, but there was issues I had with it. I think if it wasn't called Solo, it wasn't a Star Wars movie, I think a lot of people would have received yeah. it a lot better. So, the, you know, that's what I think about The Bourne Legacy. I totally agree with that. I think that's why we're getting a question like this at all, because, you know, that's the nature of the industry. You have a really probably good and successful first film that already puts the bar so high and it's so difficult to compete with that. So then you wind up maybe not liking the next one as much because you love the first one so much. And yeah, you know, again, speaking of uh, industry stigmas, sequels do tend to you know, there's a lot of them out there, especially in the horror genre, where they're they're just not as good as the originals. And, you know, we're talking about it often, especially with movies like, you know, the recent reboots of Nightmare on Elm Street, mm -hmm. uh, the, the latest Texas Chainsaw movie, stuff like that feels like cash grabs. And I don't want to imply that the people who worked on that didn't work hard and try their best, but there's something about those movies that just feels lazy and in inexcusable mm -hmm. to me. All right. Well, we one got more? Uh, yeah, last question. All right. This one is a Twitter question from Justin is a square. Hey, Justin, who writes, what movie slash TV character would you want to give you a pep talk on something? And what movie slash TV character would you roll your eyes at attempting to give you a pep talk? I love this question. Mm -hmm. I, lo I, I like that we're ending on hopefully a more positive note. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I would go with a, a few. I have uh, Al Pacino's character, Tony D'Amato, the coach from Any Given Sunday. He gives that speech uh, at the very end before they play, they play a game. Uh, you have King Theoden in Return of the King after he's back to his normal self, and he's giving that speech to... Uh, his people basically saying, look, some of you guys are going to die. Um, Bill Pullman, obviously, 
in Independence oh, Day yeah. as a president. Uh, as far as uh, who I wouldn't take a pep talk from or I'd roll my eyes, uh, Alan, Zach Galifianakis' character from ha The Hangover. That's such a good example. I would, like, he would be saying something. I'd be like, no, no, no. I'm going to do the opposite of what this guy is telling me. Uh, I like that one. So with characters that I would want to get a pep talk from, so... I'm going back to Bridesmaids, mm -hmm. and I'll say Melissa McCarthy's Megan in that movie, because I love that conversation that she has with Kristen Wiig's character, where she's couch. just like, oh, you yeah. think you have no friends? Yeah. I'm right here. And I don't know. I think that that speaks a lot of truth to, you know, people with friends out there where in the moment, mm -hmm. you know, you just feel so alone, like yeah. you don't have anything. And then someone's like right there to help you. I always found that moment for that character really charming. Uh, Michael Stuhlbarg and Call Me By Your Name, because mm -hmm. I think that speech he gives at the end, it's obviously very directed at uh, Elio and what he's going through, mm -hmm. but there, there's truths to that speech that I think is well are well worth anybody hearing, no matter what you're going through. Uh, Richard Jenkins in The Shape of Water, mm -hmm. I love the transformation of that character in you know the middle towards the end of the movie where he basically winds up looking at Sally Hawkins' character and says, you know what, I recognize you need this mm -hmm. and I'm gonna help you get there. With the rolling your eyes one, though, I did not prepare for that because I have an empty bullet point there. <laughs> that happens sometimes. It does happen. I think it's because as I read this question, too, I got really crazy with, with like what character would I want to give a pep talk to? And I started to think about that. And then I went straight back to the Richard Jenkins character where, like, you know, he, he's really, like, down about yes. everything. And all I want to do is, like, jump to the screen and shake him and be like, like, you're you're better than, than these guys. You're mm -hmm. better than this career, the, than this company that you're trying to get back into. Yeah. I, so, need to, I need to think of a good one, though. Oh, it's going to bother me. But that's, that's who you'd give a pep talk to? I would give a pep talk to him. I'm trying to find maybe, maybe an Avenger. Like, uh -huh. who, would, who would I not want to give me? Or who, now I'm, I'm getting it backwards again. Who would I roll my eyes at? <laughs> Probably Drax. I, I would probably roll my eyes, but also laugh at that. There's, there's definitely more in there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I would probably know. roll my eyes at Vin Diesel's character in Fast and Furious, but it's just because I know that same family speech so yes. well for so long. If you hear the same thing over and over, it kinda, there's, there's only so long. It's funny like though, that doing kind of like research for this. Like, there were people that. Because I looked up like best movie speeches or whatever, yeah. and there are people that put the same ones like that we'd say okay, like let's say the Bill Pullman one from okay. uh, Independence Day. That'd be on people's best and be on people's worst. So a lot of those speeches for different people kind of that's interesting went different ways. Going depending back on you to, take it. to Mean Girls, someone I would definitely roll my eyes at is Gretchen Wieners. Yeah. <laughs> I would one hundred percent not take anything she says yes. to heart. <laughs> well, she's trying to start fetch, so well, that's not it's it. It's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, all right, that's it. We're done. <laughs> that was your Saturday edition of Collider Mailbag. Thanks to everybody who sent in a question. Thanks to everybody who's watching right now. Don't forget to like and share this video. Dennis, thank you for being here as always. Make sure you tune in tomorrow morning for Sunday's edition, where I'll be joined by John Roca. See you guys soon. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.